But the truth of this pan-African civilization was suppressed for many years. Dr. Alex Skirman is trying to overturn the legacy of South Africa's racist past. She has been excavating an archaeological site on the banks of the Limpopo River. In the early part of the 20th century, um, there were rumors in the white South African community about this place, in their minds linked to the Queen of Sheba or some other early white civilization in Southern Africa, trying to show that the Phoenicians or the Sabaeans, basically anybody who was a bit lighter skinned than Africans, were here first and that they found the opposite, that Africans actually had an amazing great history and that they had earlier states um, running before, way before um, any white set foot in Africa. This site, known as Mapungubwe, the place of the jackal, formed the heart of a kingdom similar to the earliest civilizations in Europe. Mapungubwe was the core, it was the capital of a massive state. Um, about 5,000 people living around this hill. But then you had several thousand other people living in the valley who produced the agricultural surplus to feed the city or town. They had cattle, they had sheep, they grew sorghum, millet, they worked iron. It was a massive amazing development that occurred in Southern Africa. And this was not an isolated state. It formed part of a much larger economic network that had spread across Southern Africa and beyond. These are Mapungubwe beads. They're gorgeous blue ones. These are glass beads that came down the Indian Ocean coast. Um, and through them, we know that Mapungu was part of the international trade network, um, linking it all the way to the coast. It's an incredible African accomplishment to set up such a complex trade network that links all the way into northern Botswana, bringing material from there and taking it all the way to the Indian Ocean coast. So, Africans had overcome the problems of agriculture that defeated the European settlers. They had developed a unique tropical system of agriculture that had spread across the continent and become the foundation of complex societies trading as far afield as India. But there was an even more extraordinary story at the heart of this flourishing tropical civilization. As soon as they entered the tropics, Europeans and their imported animals had fallen victim to terrible disease. Fevers racked their population. Yet tropical Africans showed fewer of the same effects. Many of them even survived that most lethal of European weapons, smallpox. The disease that had devastated the native peoples of North and South America, and the Khoisan of the African Cape. How was this possible? Diamond believes it all comes back to geography. Many of the diseases that were killing the settlers and their European livestock were unique to the tropical world. They had never encountered them before. It was a complete reversal of the usual pattern of conquest. 
In the New World, the germs had been a weapon on the side of Europeans, killing indigenous people. Here, it was indigenous germs to which Europeans had not a history of exposure. So here we have guns, germs, and steel again, but the germs working in the opposite direction, killing Europeans. The settlers and their imported livestock had fallen victim to a host of tropical infections and diseases. But African cattle, over thousands of years, had developed resistance to many of these tropical germs. And these cattle might also explain why tropical Africans had not succumbed to smallpox on the same scale as the Khoisan people of the Cape. The smallpox virus originally crossed over from cattle to man centuries ago, and experts now believe it may have first originated in tropical Africa. Africans were certainly familiar with the disease. They had even developed methods of vaccination that bestowed an immunity for life. And there was more. Native Africans had also developed antibodies against one of the most virulent diseases on Earth. Malaria. Carried by the humble mosquito, this was the disease that was now overwhelming the European settlers. But tropical Africans were combating malaria with more than just antibodies. Their entire civilization had evolved to help them avoid infection in the first place. They tended to settle in high or dry locations, away from the wet, humid areas where mosquitoes breed. And by living in relatively small communities, spread out over vast areas, Africans could limit the level of malaria transmission. It was an extraordinary achievement. But the Europeans understood little of the Africans' way of life. They built settlements by the rivers and lakes they used for water, in places infested by mosquitoes. Thousands died. So, it seemed that the tropics had defeated European guns, germs, and steel, and that Africans had emerged triumphant. They had evolved a complex civilization well-suited to the tropical world, a civilization that had spread throughout the continent in a vast cultural diaspora. Was this the end of European guns, germs, and steel in Africa? What would the future hold for this mighty tropical civilization? The Europeans had failed to settle Africa's land. This would become no North or South America. But Africa still had one great draw for the colonizing powers. Vast reserves of natural resources, copper, diamonds, gold. European conquest and the story of guns, germs, and steel would now enter a whole new age. In the late 1800s, in what is now the Democratic Republic of the Congo, the Belgians drove millions of native Africans from their villages, setting them to work gathering rubber, mining copper and other minerals. Burning their homes behind them, 
reduce 